All right, ladies, gents. Today we're talking about Lyria again um, and around a very different topic, which is uh, the city of the future. Let's brainstorm new ideas about parks, recs, tourism, and hospitality. Did anybody watch this uh, series called Parks and Recreation? <laughs> maybe one watch? time, maybe. <laughs> I have to say I did not survive past the first episode. I just got really, I, my, my girls tell me all the time, it was very nice. You just have to get through the second, uh, first uh, season and it gets better and better and better. And I tell myself, maybe I should, <laughs> maybe I should. But I did go through the first. And I do, um, just to give you sort of fair warning, my family is, uh, till today, it's still run one of the top travel companies in Malaysia. Um, it's called Sri America Travel. I cut my teeth from the age of 26 in tourism business, um, running cruise ships, casino ships, travel, tourism. So it's a subject that I know unnecessarily well. Um, <laughs> uh, absolutely useless in, in modern day life that I live today, um, except whenever I have a webinar <laughs> like this to have conversations, it can, it can land. Um, so we're, we're here to talk about parks, regs, tourism, travel. I like to frame this a little bit um, to say that we're looking for great ideas to do with data and technology around how we can help parks and regs and travel and tourism. And the reason I frame, I, I frame it slightly differently um, as I do and I did with the social and mental health issues is to really start exploring a little bit of that hybrid physical and digital, which I'm always about. I think internet's great. It's got you know its issues. It's very digital. You know, it ties us to a phone. It ties us to an iPad. It ties us to a computer. Um, and I like to the 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 more phone, of course, liberates that movement into allowing us to do that hybrid just a bit better. COVID, of course, made that a necessity. You take your phone now. You either show your COVID pass or your some kind of travel rights and things like that. And all of a sudden something that was only lived now jumps out of the box into something that you wave around with your hand and, and then go into places with physical places. And you have all this thing that physicality brings into the equation um, that was never in digital. Um, one of the interesting things is to then really think about, perhaps to frame this, is the consumer, uh, the journey of the individual. And how, when we start getting outside of that box, of that computer, out of that phone, how the experience, that is that hybrid experience, how does that really work? And I like to use as an example here, is the function of this thing called the camera on the phone. Now, I belong to a generation that said, why the hell would I need a camera on my phone? I'm sorry, it shows how old I am, but I belong to a generation where actually I said those words, I'm ashamed of myself being a tech person, but I'm ashamed. Um, I said, why would you need a camera? What's wrong with your camera, you know? And in my book, I said very clearly, like, oh, wow. Um, as I learned through my research that the most, from a market's perspective, sorry, the most precious real estate in the world today for a market to exist that is digital is one foot in your body. We know this because the iPhone on the mobile phone has shown that we are transacting anything that could be digital right now that used to be physical, one foot from our body. Newspapers, anything information, anything on books, music, everything is now one foot from our body. The location of markets, I'm going to be very Lancasterian about this, um, the location of markets have moved from its physicality to one foot from our body. But there are certain things you cannot translate one foot from your body. Having a cup of tea, eating, drinking, talking to people face to face. Now, in such situations, the problem of the market shifts to trans from transacting 
to matching and coordination. Hence, you have the Airbnb and the Uber to match when you need transport and where you need to live somewhere. So the way markets have evolved of combining digital and physical, where we need to sleep somewhere, we need to go somewhere, was the information, how it's being used for matching and for coordination. But we only have Airbnb and Uber, seriously. I mean, God, we do a hell of a lot more than that. <laughs> but we don't. Airbnb and Uber are the only two so far that make coordination. I mean, what, what is that, Professor, you like to say? Um, the largest accommodation provider in the world doesn't even own a single property. And the largest transportation provider in the world doesn't own a single vehicle because it, these are the markets for coordination. And to bring it back into parks, regs, tourism, and travel, is the idea that for a lot of things, we may not need to move out of the house, studying, education, but for a lot of things we do. And that's where parks, regs, which is stuff around us, travel, tourism, when we go somewhere, now become the center of attraction, almost as though mobility of our lives has been confined to which the internet cannot touch. <laughs> it's like, we, we do it by exclusion now, not, not inclusion, by omission. The internet can touch everything, but kind of not able to touch parks, regs, and us physically moving around till they discover teleportation. I know that Facebook tries with the Oculus to go places virtually, kind of not it though. So I would like to think about how a city, when we think about parks, regs, travel, travel, and our physical body, which is very, you know, sensorial. It's all about sensing, right? That somehow the digital and physical doesn't quite get it. And how do we get it? And how can we get it? And we can talk about mental reality as technology. We can talk about coordination, but I'm open to talking about any of that and then saying, what should the future of the city uh, focus on to help do this better and why? Open up, who wants to go first? You know, the, the term city confuses me a little bit because I don't view, you know, I view the ground as a platform and the word city or the word state or neighborhood doesn't mean that much to me. It's just that I'm on the ground. And so when, when I think of in context, I think of in time and space. And so I think of digital offerings in time. I think of uh, space um, as location. And so, the, the word city confuses me a little bit and, and you know, maybe, you know, a state's, I'm trying to break it down to a business model is a city's trying to be viable. And um, is a state's business model different than a city's business model or an association like a neighborhood's business model? I'm not sure that I'd have to think that through. So the word city kind of confuses me there, Irene. Um, but, I, I, okay. I what you okay. Said. Okay. And, and the other thing I, I, I grapple with is that, you know, the, the internet or the third party providers are, they think this is going back to like a paradigm change. They think that implied intent is the best way to capture intent. So I have behavior and someone's measuring that behavior and then they start to imply my intent from my behavior. Well, it kind of confuses me. Why don't they, why don't I explicitly communicate my intent? And so now they don't have to capture my data. Now they just need permission to get my data. And my data is very explicit communicating my intent. 
you don't have to imply anything anymore. So in time and space, I communicate explicitly my intent about the tea I want to drink. And the, I like my tea hot, but I don't like the, the ceramic that's holding my tea hot. And so is there a sensor there or something that can help me so I can sip my tea, but not to have a hot finger? I don't know. So that is a marrying a solution of the digital and the physical realm that um, may, 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 might be worth looking at or talking about. Great. Um, I'm coming. Um, let me talk a little bit and then I'll pass it on to Joss. So I love the confusion because what you tell me with that confusion is there is an attribution issue. When you come out of your house, you don't think the city is kind of relevant. So you do not attribute where you are to a city. You might attribute it to a state. You might attribute it to the country, but you don't attribute it to the city. That sounds like a power issue. Has cities lost their power? When citizens don't feel that they are attributed to a city anymore? Do cities even need to exist as we get smaller or bigger? Can't a state do? What is the role of the institution? Should they be looking at these things? Why should they? Is it necessary to devolve state to city or evolve a city? I mean, what, what are the dynamics here that is being solved that way? We have several of these issues here in the UK where we have you know, city councils and then we have the, also we have the, uh, uh, the county councils, you know, so like state and, and city as well. And very often when we look at the internet and we think, oh, centralization or decentralization, software is amazing at doing that oscillation between source of centralization and decentralization very quickly. Not as quickly as we'd like to see, but then it does it very quickly. Whereas in physical systems, centralization and decentralization is baked into their institutional structures. We kind of inherited the notion that there should be a city council and there should be a county council, even if maybe they're no longer relevant or that there be a state or a city when there is an irrelevance. What kind of subgroups do we attribute ourselves to? Are we part of a veterans club? Are we part of the bingo club? So these are all this, you know, the subgroups and the subcultures that we feel we belong to and that's the attribution we give ourselves to them in the physical world. Yeah. And I love the fact that you say, what is the city? What is the city? Maybe the problem is that exactly. What is the city? What is, yeah. how do we get the attribution back? And you see parks and recreations. Do we now think that, oh, do you go and see the park and say, oh, the city is doing a good job? No, you don't. And I think yeah. one of the, my favorite attribution that I love to use is, is when we pick up the phone and then we use Google Maps and we find something, we say, what do we say? We say, wow, this Google Maps is great. You attribute it to Google Maps. You did not attribute it to the phone. You didn't say, oh, I love my phone. You say Google Maps. You see how the layers of attribution works for value? Yeah. That is huge because when you graph business model as kind of what I do, attribution makes value come clear. If you yeah. don't attribute your phone, if you attribute Google Maps, you know what your value system is. That's right? true. And in New York City, I attribute my ability to network to the city, but in a in Illyria, I do not. And and we might think of that, you know, if there were network effects in Illyria, then maybe I would attribute value to Illyria. But the network effects that are present in New York City or Silicon Valley um, make, they're so strong that I don't even attribute it to Google Maps. I say it's the city. I know, right? It's like, that's fascinating to me to understand attribution that's going on in the person's head. You go to a park and it's great. Do you say, oh, the city is great? Or do you say, wow, the weather is really great today? 
<laughs> you you don't you know what we do when we attribute is 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 some of the more fundamental things. And I think to act, to address that, there could be better data and technology tools to help you become aware as to why the city has done the job they are. Sometimes it's a communication issue. Sometimes it's information issue, right? I mean, I like to, I always smile when I walk down the river camp and I see uh, park benches by the river and I see this bench has been donated by this family. <laughs> and I'm going like, okay, so this family has donated money to keep this bench here. I'm very thankful to this family because it's been attributed directly to them by labeling this part bench. And that is explicit attribution, right? Yeah. But you don't think about what was the infrastructure, the city, who was the people who orchestrated and coordinated that? So I think there is that level. Um, Joss, what are your ideas? Sorry, I was just scribbling down my notes and my diagrams as you talk. Uh, <laughs> it's brilliant. Um, as you were talking, I was wondering about, so, and listening to what Kevin had to say as well about this concept of the city, which is something that I struggle with living in the countryside um, and thinking about how, you know, my place, my journey, my experience. And I was thinking about the, the the augmentation that we do in the the new fashion word of of metaverse and and actually we've had metaverses for a long time and it's it's that interesting language of the metaverse versus a metaverse um and i was having conversations with uh, colin harrison a while ago who's ex-head of ibm research and he back right back in the 90s had come up with the idea of the virtual mall so you could walk down your local mall on your computer and, and, and see things. And, and you think, well, actually, we're still hoping for something like that. Well, some people are. Well, and okay, so then I think about, uh, yeah, it's that. But then it's it's also now the, where's my phone? That's charging. Now it's like something like Pokemon Go. Uh, oh. Oh, am I back? Okay, you broke off there. Okay, awesome. you're back. The gremlins trying to stop us talking. Uh, I'm thinking about you know Pokemon Go and the success that that still has, or or Wizards um, Unite, which is the Harry Potter version, and they're still being played. So after the whole and and that got people out in into the parks and recs to to actually play together. And so I'm I keep trying to work out is 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 space created or is it made and is place built over time because then you talk about time but time is a measure so how do those two things how do those three things relate to each other which again is information transfer and i find it fascinating that your previous history was in in tours because actually all that is a, all tourism is about is how we uh, impart information and how we discover information and how we record that information so if we're thinking about the city of the future the city of the future is quite possibly the globe because, because we're all suddenly able to be, um, our, our ideas are able to travel at the speed of light. And it's the ideas that matter, not necessarily um, the physical place. And that's why I think TikTok is such a fascinating study because the, the, the really successful ones like the shuffle videos, for instance, they get the most um, reactions and interactions and transfers when there's it's in front of and in unique places. So you're seeing all these incredible dancers that are incredibly creative and hard to do, and they're being done around the world in, in real time. And so people are sharing in, in both the, the space and the places and uh, having, uh, uh, they're getting a level of empathy about other people who can do exactly the same thing. So I think that is a real fascinating um, development. Irene, let me, let me jump in here. I, let me throw something at everybody and get your feedback. So when I think of the PDA, it, in, it allows me to be 
an organization of one or a company of one. So instead of a company of a lot of users with all their data, I am now a company of one with all my data. But if I am at a park or in a marketplace and my data is being shared with a select group of people, other park visitors, then are we not um, park users of one? And maybe that can bring us back to a city of one. And, and that's of course where the data passport or some sort of walled data environment um, comes into play where we do become one city. Because you know when I think of New York City, I think of a culture that is valuable for networking, but why shouldn't I think of a park or a city, an, a, a Lyria, a small city, a rural city, as providing that kind of value of one to me? I think that's a great point. Um, so there are lots of stuff here. Wow, there's so much of it. I Did Irene get frozen? Yeah, I mean, we can't hear you anymore. I think we've lost you. He decided that he'll do a sand pit through- Irene, we lost you for like uh, 15 seconds. Oh, sorry, can you hear me now? Yeah, a little bit oh. um, cut off still, but better. Okay, so some years ago, um, the EPSRC, which is a research council here in, in the UK, uh, did a sand pit. Do you know what a sand pit is? You've got a lot of people coming into a room and brainstorm ideas. They decided to do a virtual sand pit, which is basically a bit like, um, what is that word? Second world, so no, second, everybody went in. Second life. Second life, that's right, second life. You had an avatar, you carried a little picture of yourself and you walked around. And they said, I want to see how you actually interacted with this. So I'm naturally playful. And, you know, so I, I usually, when I go, I'm, my, my engineers know this very well. I go into a system, my intention is always to break it because I constantly do it, right? This is my job. My job is to break it. So I went in there, I walked everywhere and touched every wall and did everything and talked to different people. And then when we were trying to percolate to new ideas, uh, they said, you, you have rooms. So when you go into a room, only the two of you can speak, that virtual room. And I thought, oh, interesting. You'd have that in the real world where you have coffee and then you just go into one corner and just talk to each other. So they've emulated that. Okay, good. We go into a room, tried it out, and we stayed private. And, and then as we started to put these post-its on the wall about what the ideas were, I realized one thing. In the physical world, I have to write it, put it on the wall. In that world, I could cut and paste from whatever I found on Google. <laughs> so I could cut and paste links on the wall. I became very efficient in terms of what I thought new ideas were and, and images on the wall. And then the wall got really big and they went like, oh, there's not much space. Let's lengthen the room. <laughs> so they lengthened the room so there was more wall space to put post-its and I thought, Interesting. There are capabilities in the digital place that doesn't exist in the, the physical space that could help and uh, sort of um, amplify experiences. Um, but then we also know that there will be ways in that digital can dampen experience, like get off that phone, you <laughs> know, stop talking on that phone or stop using phone, you know. So I think there are dampeners and there are amplifiers in this space. And that's kind of what both of you kind of alluding to. You use the PDA, does it amplify because we've got each other's interest and taste and we can make a city of one, does it amplify the experience? And um, does it then, uh, does it dampen? One of the things that we used to do, I used to do when I was helping museums do uh, digital and physical was to say, that, that social element, which I think is really interesting with, when you talk about TikTok, 
imagine walking into a museum, and I remember working with the, uh, the Stratford Pornevin at, at, at Shakespeare, uh, and walking into his house, and it was a museum, and you could see things, but then being able to talk to a real person about this thing in front of you, but this person didn't come from here. And he will then talk to you about that, which is in front, because he's a great Shakespeare enthusiast. And he could talk you through the room. Why are we creating, so instead of making this audio static, really boring narrative of the history of this painted ceiling, which I recently went to, <laughs> Sorry, I'm just going to say this. I'm going to be very apologetic to Greenwich for this. Um, but imagine if it was a conversation with someone who knew about the painted ceiling and could give you a much more interesting perspective of that painted ceiling. That creates a different environment that could amplify my experience. It's like having a friend with you in a museum. My husband hates museum. I love museum. He says we're not going anywhere in there, right? And in a way, parks, recreation, what do we do there? How do we do it? We don't do it with people. What if you've got nobody? Do you not go? Um, and in a similar way, travel too. People say, I, I have a friend who says this to me all the time. The world is biased against single people. All travel and tourism, rewards you as a couple, punishes you if you're single. From a hotel room, literally, <laughs> to just traveling alone. But is, is, that, is that something to do, everything you're saying that I keep thinking this word etiquette co keeps coming back to me and the etiquette of, of being in our, uh, so like you're saying, traveling as a, as a single person, the etiquette, culturally has been you know you're successful when you get married and you have a, a family and, and you 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 do that but the etiquette of 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 recent well not even the rest because there isn't an etiquette that's been established yet and it's the cultures that are clashing right now i feel uh and the the what we're trying to figure out like you're saying the expanding of the space just well need to fill more need to fill more What's what's the boundaries and where what, what is the t determination of of limits and boundaries and therefore the etiquette of how we be in our cities of the future? Um, I think. Well, you know, Joss, if the marketplace matches explicit intents, then I'm only going to get pinged by um, by uh, things that that have good etiquette. It's interesting about the marketplace and intent and what I call signals. What you, you say explicit intent is, is the signal I give. In the physical world, you kind of walk into a shop and people will size you up. You know, you, the, your physicality is a signal of who you are, um, your, your height and your weight. And you look at you and for some reason, the world feels that that's perfectly fine. There's no privacy issue at all. <laughs> but, you know, if, imagine if you try to do that online. You were like, oh, you're not private. I said, you're not private the moment you walk into a shop. <laughs> you know, this one good yeah. look at you. you. You know what you look like. But it's okay because it's not collected in mass, right? You just, it's a moment in time. It's not kept anywhere. And this is the kind of issue we have, right? But the explicit intent can be completely conveyed in a shop. I'm looking for a red shirt, medium size. You don't even have to tell, you can tell I'm medium size. You know, I am explicitly saying I'm looking for a shirt and you go like, oh yes, we have shirts for you with this. You cannot do that digitally, right? Digitally, you walk, you go into a, a website and all they can do is, you can imagine a whole bunch of people just whispering, who do you think this person is? Oh, he's just click on that. Oh no, 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 he's look on that one. And he's just, just trying to infer because they can't see you, they can't tell your signal. And you just wonder, there is a flaw in the digital world that cannot signal. And there's a flaw in the physical world where you can, but there's not enough data. <laughs> there's, there's too little data. It's just you. But, but Irene, the PDA can explicitly broadcast my intent. 
Yes, can it, yes, it yeah. can. The passport with the data pass on top of VA, absolutely you can. But I yeah. think the question here is the business model, because you're now you're now fracturing um, institutional structures here. It's it's. I'll give you an example. For the longest time, I waited to see who should be the one to build that link between my Samsung printer and my iPad. Mm. <laughs> Because obviously my iPad just wants me to print on some bloody air printer owned by Apple, something or compatible with Apple. And Samsung is sitting down there having Wi-Fi enabled. Now, who is building these bridges? And bridges are the hardest to build in in the business, in an economic world. Traversing boundaries are the hardest things to build business model because neither wants to own it. Because the that because of the externality of the fact that if you did it, he would be just free riding on it, right? If you did it, he free rides on it. If he did it, you free ride on it. Links are the hardest to build in a phys in any institutional structures. Inside, easy. If I own this system, I could do lots and lots of stuff. If I own that system, I'd be lots of stuff. Between systems, the hardest thing because of all these externalities, of all the of all the links problem. It took a while and guess who eventually built it? Samsung built something because the power of iPads was so high, it became a business case to build it, to be linked to iOS, right? So you kind of need the power to shift and become big before you build the link because otherwise it doesn't, it, it doesn't work. So now you say, yeah, I've got a PDA, everybody got PDA, who's going to build this, right? These are links we're talking about. These are coordination. Right. And one of the city's biggest issue is coordination. They don't want to own the data. They want to own, they want, they, they want better coordination. So the central problem with parks, regs, travel tourism is always, there are no very good linky type business models. <laughs> they just aren't, <laughs> they just aren't. And everybody who tries, it becomes a big monolithic thing and owns something, right? So um, that's the essential problem, the coordination problem and the business models of who owns coordination um, in, in my world. So you're right, the aspiration is we can see it, but why wouldn't anyone build it? So I don't want to be negative. We have to think about- No, no that's, that's hugely positive, Irene, because <laughs> I think the that's the, what do you do when you go over a bridge? You're transferring. And, and the right now we've got business models that are purely focused on, on the ownership and the, the consumption of something, which is why public spaces, you know, London is a prime example of what is a private space and what is a, 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 an open commercial space, which is why protesting in London is so hard because if you protest somewhere, on your own private space, you just kicked off and the protest is 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 dismantled. So actually, but actually what, what's more interesting, I think, and this is where the music industry is a prime example, and, and, and it's great that you focus on that in your book, is that you know it's it's a transfer and, and uh, an artifact is a uh, a transfer of value that that changes in in time, in space, as, as you point out, but also. In, in environments as well, and in, in context, in cultural exposure to different things. So it's why I come back to, to Parks and Recs and actually the whether or not you are offline or online, what's happening in those spaces of culture is transfers of ideas. And instead of putting the, the I, I, I dislike the idea of renting places, like Guy Standing says, you know, we've created a class that is the precariat that everything is rented. And so therefore, what is what, what is it that we as an individual have? And, and this is the thing that the Luddites were, were first opposing, was it what well, they weren't opposing technology progression. They were opposing the fact that their purpose was being eroded and therefore the value of themselves as, as people that they could provide for their families and have a future, that's what they were opposing. And so what we're seeing full circle again is we're seeing these individuals, you know, the UK right now is a prime example of where is the workforce? What is a workforce? And I'm, I dislike the term workforce because actually we no longer work, work in set tram lines and we no longer have a job for life. 
we're, we are far more um, adaptive in our everyday lives and we, we operate in roles. And actually the Parks and Recs program is really good because the, the motive underneath it all is that, that it's all about the identity and, pers- and uh, identity and purpose of the individuals. Now their, their caricatures and they're hilarious, but actually underneath it, there's this very raw human, the humanity act of, of identity purses and, and the sharing and the collective ritual that we all do, whatever our cultures. And I think that's what's really exciting when we talk about the business model of, of the internet is that it's actually shifting away from the business model of information consumption to the transfer of information and how we how we value that and then we can start to look at all the different value transfers that go on in different yeah. and we can start to map it and that's really exciting it's it's interesting that you say that because that's core to a lot of the work i've been doing for the last um kind of eight years and i used to illustrate that um major mindset mindset shift that to say right look around your room describe this room and everybody will describe it based on objects and noun, chair, table, ceiling. And I said, okay, good. You've listed 10, five things to describe this room. Now describe this room, not based on its nouns and objects, but based on verbs alone. Hmm. And then they go, breathing. Oh, good. I said, good, at least you've got one verb. <laughs> um, um, and then sitting. I said, not bad, not chair, but sitting. Um, if you force a, a class to think about verbs, you force them to understand sort of Gibsonian kind of way uh, and, and Giddens kind of way that all our nouns and objects are actually there to promote flows and actions and verbs the real value is in the verbs it's not in the nouns the nouns are just attributions of verbs we need it we need we need to sit hands get chair so so it, 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 the idea therefore is the original idea of a value must come from a displaced Oh, I'm going to be so Heideggerian about this. Um, it's about a displaced nature that re- wants to go from one state to a next state and therefore creates a verb in doing so, right? So this is very academic, I know, I'm sorry. Um, but the idea that if you define the world in terms of verbs, then parks and recs and travel and tourism is just a set of activity and journeys. We are all just talking about journeys. And therefore the business model is about journeys. It's about the transfer of information, about the moving of things from one to another, the change of state from something to another. If you get the world to think about that, then human-centric design is therefore about human journeys in the way we think about how information flows or physicality of things flow and how they map together. Now, in a lot of the work that we design, and so some of the work in PDAs um, and HAT and server literally was embedding a lot of those it was all about flows. We, we only care about how things flow. They didn't transit, they didn't use, they didn't all of that. In the physical world, if we started to think about that, we're saying, oh, but we can't see them. They're not there. Breathing is not there. So that suggests that we are prejudicing our sight. Our attribution is prejudiced by sight. If we can't see what you describe the room as would be not what you can see, but perhaps how else would you feel with four other senses here? You can hear, you can taste, touch, but because sight overwhelms us all, our entire structure of a wild world and the value system is therefore shaped by sight. And we know that because marketing literally do all their positioning and branding and everything based on sight. But the world of digital brings something else to just sight. It brings a lot more 
verb like things, TikTok videos, um, ability to connect and do things together, not just creates the social animal that releases the social animal in all of us, but what it generally means is it, a repository of nouns in the room can be circumvented by a suppository of infinite verbs with nouns all over the world. And that, that perfectly links into the research that's been done by Indigenous AI groups as well, because the, 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 there's a great paper by Indigenous AI written by Hawaii Institute about how they felt that the Web, web 2.0 was colonised and was defined. And actually, in, in Indigenous cultures, the whole point about their, uh, their language is about the verb and the wholesome journey. Whereas a colonial language is all about straight lines and defining the boundaries. And I think that ties in really well with, with this idea of infinite verbs. Um, and in some ways, is Parks and Recs a, a boundary of where play is? Yes. So um, you can say a park is a, bound, is a, a closed system of limited nouns. Mm -hmm and limited objects. But if made to be into embracing something digital, can be made to be circumvented by a repository of verbs that deals with nouns from elsewhere. Um, I, I or, uh, particularly information. So I used to say, you know, you go to a park, what wouldn't it be lovely if you could just draw a hopscotch thing and then we can start playing hopscotch. No, you can't because you need chalk you need a pavement and, oh gosh, really? But if you had a way, you then have a way of people playing hopscotch with you. Imagine the same hopscotch in another part somewhere and you can see his yellow little dot dancing on it while you're doing it. You're, so it's a bit like your TikTok. They say he's doing it and I'm doing it. Yeah, but, and, and that's what's so amazing about Minecraft and Roblox now as well is, is that is a park when they're creating the most phenomenal structures. And, and that, that we can just build a hopscotch right now and then people will come populate it and it's wonderful. Yeah. And, and the, the social structures that are happening within groups of young people without too many boundaries, there are boundaries, so there is a, a park element, but the, the, the trading, the sharing, the caring that each other do, and, and it's not so much like, Call of Duty, where it's all going to shoot you up and, and you know, who's can get the most score by killing someone. You know, th this is far more constructive play um, and in, in very innocent play as well. And, and that innocence is, is beautiful to, to, to see no, in, and, that, and for in that too. verse. And for adults too, I just think that we, we spend a lot of time talking about play for children. We don't talk about play for adults. We don't talk about going into a park and doing something together with our kids in, in across time, space, or whatever it is, because somehow adults don't do that. I mean, you know, and Pokemon suddenly comes and all, every single adult is out there looking for a Pokemon. And, and you think, wow, there's a lot of pent up energy. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of frustrations. <laughs> Irene, Irene, can we get back to the links? And so if I think of Illyria as a business model, and I think of it as a service system and it's trying to integrate, integrate different resources. And I think of Parks and Rec, I think of all the different services on, in this ecosystem called Illyria. Is, aren't the links um, that need to be created significantly being reduced on a daily basis where, you know, the, Building these links is just a matter of time, and it's and it's pretty soon. Is that correct? It's 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 hard because, as we all remember, look at the United States and the railway station, uh, the railway system. Links are the hardest thing in the world to build. They are usually destined to becoming a, a public good, and until today, in America, there are no rail links east to west. It is still Route sixty six. So links are not trivial to build. 
because the attribution of who should build them and the, uh, the amazing ability once it's built to be a utility and demolished into becoming a commoditized system with absolutely no re returns whatsoever is hmm. still entrenched in our physical systems. Okay. Now, now digital well, the, is better. Right. So, so the un understood. So the companies that are joining Illyria's data passport uh, ecosystem that uh, they're offering perks, that's evidence that, oh, there's going to be a link. Yes. Yes, so um, one of the things I've been speaking to as been working in the passport system is uh, Wilfred. Um, Wilfred is uh, a CEO of Urban Systems. Um, they are working in, in Oregon State. And um, Wilfred will be speaking at the hackathon weekend <laughs> um, about Illyria um, and about how the absolutely these links need to come together. These links that bridge, bridge not just the physical and the digital, but core infrastructure that allow um, businesses in Illyria to access beyond and for others to come in and have uh, the ability to, to have this infrastructure to, to then say, this is the model for what, what the rest of the world should look like. You're right. And, that, and that's exactly what, why DataSwift is in Illyria because we have a very progressive and very supportive mayor who is supportive of all kind of my crazy ideas um, of what, what I think the future should be. Um, and also that he believes that it comes to the center of um, data ownership because that's where the center of coordination has to start um, yeah. to then build these links out. But yeah, you're right. It is exactly the, the mission and the hackathon is part of ideation um, and ideas around if these things happen, then what should be built on top of it? Because it's a quite a new world. What are these new ideas for parks and recs and travel employees? So then in the end, parks and recs becomes a service that's being subsidized through this data ecosystem that it has a lot of links in it. Correct, because the idea of a physical system and the old idea of public goods having to be served and also delivered or built by a, a state, it's old. Um, the only reason you have to build it like that is because no one could internalize that into a, a, a normal market. Now, on the on the <laughs> on the internet, we know very well <laughs> that they have internal internalized links really well uh, because it's software. These are not um, these links are no longer social links. They are actual physical links. So you can attribute now one piece of data pass that's been transacted all the way up to the infrastructure. You can call it tax, you can call it a piece of revenue, but you can absolutely attribute it. So whether the micropayments that is given back to the city is just in sense at scale, it is still something. And you can do that better in a digital environment than you could do it in a physical environment. It's a bit like um, you build, uh, if we had a digital kind of railway system as an analogy between East and West, then there is a way to attribute every single passenger over time, over 30 to 50 years, and it's ticket price down to everything from the maintenance to the, uh, the utility of the infrastructure. Um, you can do that because it's software. It's a lot harder with physical systems because upfront costs are, infrastructure costs are really, really expensive. But on the internet, infrastructure costs are not that expensive anymore. We, we can roll out in one entire country um, a, a data passport network um, just like that. It's, it's all about coordination. Right. But, but that's why I think it is possible for there to be a hybrid thing of, of state. So I agree that state as a, as a form in itself is probably out, is outdated when we con consider the libertarian models of the internet. But I wonder if, I th and I, 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 I'm of the view it is possible to create a hybrid model that, that meets the, like the sweet spot basically of, of uh, new power and old power of, of how do you, because there's got to be elements of governance and trust there that is for, for the people uh, and the, the system to do that. And that's called democracy, the demos and the system. Uh, and how how is that done? And I think that's where the sy a system that is designed for the now is crucial. And you have, uh, you know, you bring in data trusts and open data as much as private and commercial data. Um, and and how you then 
appropriate that to the context of place. Um, and I think that's one of the problems that we've had today where there's been an overly focused version on uh, private. Um, I think the city, if you look at the city of the future with the information economy and the internet becoming physical and digital space, it has to redefine itself, um, not as a service. So I think a lot of cities in the world are still looking at themselves as being service oriented. Mm -hmm. In a world that where you can all get all the services provided by everybody in any private sector or private public sector or NGO, the role of the city is, as you say, holding the trust of the people, but also that of coordination. I think we, we cannot underestimate how much there is to actually do coordination um, to ensure that you know, incentives are aligned properly, that it is still human centric, it is still, you know, that there needs to be a stakeholder of the person. And there is no one in the private sector or in the market that will hold uh, the, the sort of be the stakeholder of the person except the city. Um, if you think about the city as a coordination center and a stakeholder center holding a trust anchor, then yeah, you're absolutely right. A lot of other things can be divested. And as long as you know how to design that. Unfortunately, with my many encounters uh, of the old <laughs> arcade system, um, there is still a big debate between um, you know, big government, small government, you know, it seems to go back into the, oh, you believe in the big government and small government kind of thing. Well, I, I kind of think that in a world of digital and physical, that is not the right debate to have. Yeah. Um, the role kind of changes, but people like to bring it back to that kind of argument. Yeah, it's the same, it's the same argument. Are you left or are you right? Yeah. Them neither. Uh, I think there's a more progressive way of thinking now as participatory roles. Uh, yeah, that, that you're, you're, you're right there. So I, I think this has been a kind of weird conversation that we've been having. That's I love it. I love very it. Abstract. Um, how do we actually make it work for Illyria? Final closing remarks. And, you know, this is Illyria. It's in Ohio, small town Ohio. How, where can a, a kid or somebody who wants to do a great project on parks and recs and travel trade, where should they start to create these ideas? Minecraft. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> A game, yes. Uh, Kevin? You know, everything in my world really comes down to, you called it a journey, but uh, I, I look at users as a, in a pursuit of well-being, and those well-being factors are measurable. And so in my world it is really everything stems from quote unquote a good job and let's just call that career well-being and that leads to financial well-being which then enables the user to invest in the higher elements of the well-being uh, hierarchy um, which are social community health well-being so that's that. Those are my comments. Um, I, I I definitely think that you know there's an old adage that all politics is local, and so I'm going to say all ability placement is local, whether it's digitally or geographic. And but well, let's call it geographic. Let's call it Illyria. And so let's start there and then build from improving career well-being and and start um, tackling the other well-being factors. So, so let me um, kind of um, cap this, uh, our discussion with a small little plug of, of a paper that I've written. I wrote a paper uh, called Mimicking Firms. It's a small little paper I wrote in the Journal of Valuation um, where I talk about how the individual, as an, indi as an individual, there is um, our current institutional structures do not allow you to become any way of taking rents, taking money, except through wage. So you must earn a wage because the institutions around us do not allow us to do anything except wage. So I'll give you an example. If I was uh, splitting husks from nuts of cashew nuts of a factory, I go in every day, I split the husks from the nuts and I do about 10 kilos a day. Overnight, I went to my garage, I built this amazing robotic arm 
because I realized I've been doing this for five years. I know exactly what it is. I've done it on a robotic arm and it can just put it out there and it can just do a hundred kilos in just two hours. There is no way I can go to my employer and demand more wages. I have to become a firm and ask for an outsourcing contract of which now I can then contract to increase my wealth. Fundamentally, therefore, an individual can only take wage in economics and a firm can take capital, technology, um, and therefore, when a firm can take capital and technology on, on top of just you know, rent, what's gonna to happen to the world when we become smaller and smaller into units and, this, uh, and, and the internet gets to every one of us? Well, very simple, you can see this already. The gig economy has shown you, the digital nomads have shown you. We become firms, we mimic firms. We become our own either school proprietor or our own ink or own LLC We'll go around the world and COVID has enhanced that. Why? Because now we can take capital and they can take technology and we can increase rates. <laughs> so, so in a way, funny you used to talk about PDA, we have personal data account, but we are, you know, in about next three to six months, we'll be in, in, uh, introducing organization data accounts, ODAs, mostly because of sole proprietors in Vietnam. Uh, but the idea that we will be mimicking firms as individuals, because that's the only institutional structure that can increase our well-being and rents, to, to your point about increasing, getting a good job. Yes. So that's kind of what I'm going to leave you with, um, um, that, that individuals and a firm really doesn't matter to me. It's the same. The unit just stays the same. You're just a big firm and a small firm unless we start to change some of our institutional structures to allow individuals to be able to take better rents. But otherwise, it's, that's where it is. But thank you. Thank you, both of you. Um, thank you. I didn't see anybody else who wanted to chip in. I know that I saw Mayor Frank came in just for a bit and then he left, he said he had to go. So I'm, I'm, I was busy talking, so it's mine. I should have had Frank say a few things, but, uh, uh, but I'll, I'll send him the recording. Um, thank you, both of you. Uh, if you're here tomorrow, we'll talk about a different subject again. <laughs> uh, but hopefully there'll be other people I'm going to drag a couple of you up here to have a better conversation, not just the three of us just talking among ourselves. Not that I'm not appreciating it, I do. So um, if I do see you tomorrow, I'll be very happy to. Oh, I love these conversations. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, <laughs> Thank Josh. You so Thank you, Irene. All right, bye. Thank you.